the History Show with Mars Duncan. Good evening and welcome to the History Show on RTE Radio 1 and another entry in our series of programmes on the War of Independence. Tonight our subject is the IRA at war. We'll be looking at some of the most significant military operations of the conflict. The British really have retreated into the large cities. The IRA controlled the countryside. Keep in mind that this was also one of the first successful guerrilla wars of the industrial age. The nature of the fighting in the war was not set in stone, beginning with isolated attacks on RIC men, to attacks on RIC barracks, to full-scale battles, and the methods used by both sides changing constantly. The lady asked me could she get her coat and I replied, Miss, you'll be lucky if you get out with your life. From the knock-long rescue to the burning of the Custom House, we'll hear about the engagements that defined the war. I'm joined in studio by two guests. Dr. John Borgonovo is a lecturer in the School of History in University College Cork and a co-editor of the Atlas of the Irish Revolution. And Dr. Porigogo Rourke is an historian and the author of many books, including Truce, Murder Myth and the Last Days of the Irish War of Independence. You're both very welcome indeed. Um, now, we've discussed in previous programmes the event that has come to symbolise the beginning of the War of Independence, uh, the Solahed Beg ambush. But the four men involved in that who came to be known as the Big Four, Sean Tracy, Dan Breen, Seamus Robinson and Sean Hogan, were also involved in some other key events that happened in 1919 and indeed uh, well beyond 1919. But I suppose the most significant one in 1919 was the rescue of Sean Hogan at Knocklong Station in May of that year. Let's hear now from the RTE Radio Archives. This is Dan Breen talking about Knocklong. We went along to it. Maloney's of Embley, and we got May Maloney to do some scouting for us. But we met the trains coming from Thurles to Cork in not long. We met two trains. I think it was on the third train he was on. So we rescued him, and there were a couple of more policemen killed there. Uh, Porrick, what's the context for the not long rescue, the background to it? Well, I suppose the short answer is Sean Hogan's interest in the opposite sex. Um, basically, what you had, Hogan is one of the participants, as you said, in the Solahead Beg ambush, along with Breen, Tracy and Robinson, and all four of them go to a dance at Clonulty in Tipperary. Hogan takes an interest in a local girl, Bridget O'Keefe, and she's going back to her cousin's house in Anfield, the Maher household. So Sean Hogan, Bridget O'Keefe walk home together with Bridget's cousin, Bridget Maher, acting as their chaperone. And on the way back to Anfield, they pass the home of an RIC constable, Constable Cotter. He spots these three young people walking home. He doesn't have a clue who Sean Hogan is, but he knows that if this mystery man is in the company of Bridget Maher, he must be involved in republicanism or the IRA. So the following morning, Sean Hogan is asleep on the couch in Maher's of Anfield, and the RIC come to raid the place. They're seen coming, a warning is shouted to Sean Hogan. He gets up, he panics, he runs through the fields. The Royal Irish Constabulary spot him, running through the uh, fields and they're waiting for him. He literally jumps down from an embankment literally into their arms. They're waiting there to catch him. They take him away to Thurlis. They don't have a clue who he is when they initially capture him but they quickly identify him as Sean Hogan a most wanted man. They decide that they're going to move him to Cork to have him uh, court-martialed. Now, of course, Hogan's comrades, Dan Breen, Tracy and, and Robinson, hear what has happened to Hogan and they get in contact with Ned O'Brien, who was the leader of the local Galbally IRA uh, volunteers. And they hear that he's going to be moved from train and they plan to ambush the train at Knocklong Station. On board the train, under the command of RIC Sergeant Wallachs, are just four members of the RIC guarding Hogan and they're being faced by eight members of the IRA. Now only four of them are armed. Most of the local IRA volunteers apart from Ned O'Brien aren't actually armed. When the train pulls into the station at Knock Long, Sean Tracy and Ned O'Brien, the local IRA leader, basically come into the carriage with revolvers drawn. They point them at the RAC party and they shout, hands up, Sean, get out. And Sergeant Wallace replies, not likely. Now, at this time, the RAC have been given orders that they're to shoot prisoners rather than let them escape. Constable Enright puts his revolver up to Hogan's head, but before he can uh, shoot him, Sean Tracy and Ned O'Brien shoot Constable Enright dead. Basically then, 
all hell breaks loose. You have RIC constables, one of them, Constable Ring, runs away uh, in the he kind of panics. Another one, Constable O'Reilly, gets out onto the platform and starts shooting at Dan Breen and other members of the IRA party. And there's bullets flying in all directions. There's actually a struggle between Tracy and O'Brien to get control of Sergeant Wallace's revolver. And at the end of this, the two RIC men, Wallace and Enright, are dead. Four IRA volunteers are wounded. And another interesting thing is a consequence of it is that two people are later hanged as a result of the Knock Long rescue. One of them is Ned Foley, who was an IRA volunteer who had taken part in Knock Long. The other one is a guy called Patrick Maher. Patrick Maher was a totally innocent man. His job at the station was he checked eggs to make sure they weren't broken when they arrived. And he was hanged on the 7th of June 1921 along with, uh, with Ned Foley. And he was basically hanged on the perjured evidence of an RIC man and uh, a local informer. And I think it will be an interesting thing when we come up to the centenary of his hanging. Could there be a pardon for this man like we have for Moyle Shoga in uh, the Mount Trasna case? Another interesting thing that happens at Knock Long is that as... Dan Breen is taking part in the fighting. He's shot in the shoulder and he's shot through the lung. And a serving British soldier, a guy called Fox from Kilfinnan, comes out, throws Breen over his shoulders and actually carries him to safety. And he's later court-martialed for this. Another British soldier who was there is heard throughout the fighting shouting, up the Republic. Um, so again, it's a time when you've ex-servicemen in the British Army and these two incidents at Knock Long show that their loyalties are very much divided. Another interesting point point I'd make about uh, Knock Long is that we heard from Dan Breen there describing this in, in detail and he goes into even more vivid detail in his book. Dan Breen doesn't actually shoot and kill anyone at Knock Long, nor does he shoot and kill anyone at Solahead Beg. It's Tim Crow and Sean Tracy who shoot dead the RAC constables there, but he's very good at telling stories and making long-winded accounts of things. <laughs> and I suppose one of the things about Knock Long was that obviously, as you've described it, it is, uh, to say the least of it, it's very violent but it's also very colourful but also it comes at a time when in military terms there wasn't an awful lot going on so that perhaps gives it more prominence Well I think the idea was that the British had been putting out the story before this that these the IRA were kind of a criminal enterprise they, they were a murder gang but the fact that you had unarmed guys who were willing to rush into danger, the fact that they weren't going to leave one of their own behind it really kind of stoked a lot of interest and challenged that propaganda that was being put out Now John as Porig was saying there, the IRA volunteer army did not have a huge supply of guns and ammunition, so they had to be got from somewhere. But um, you know, they weren't going to get many guns from shooting the odd policeman. So what kind of things did they do in order to try and get weapons? So the IRA in modern parlance would be almost completely unarmed. They had very few rifles. They had a handful of machine guns. They had plenty of shotguns and they had plenty of revolvers, and those were pretty easy to get. They went out to country houses, grabbed every shotgun they could get their hands on. Anybody they knew who had a revolver, those were taken or seized or handed in. And revolvers and pistols were pretty easy to import, but the IRA was pretty bad at importing rifles. So that compelled IRA units to try to arm themselves. And the people who had the arms were the Crown Forces, the police, and the army. And so these initial attacks were carried out primarily by the Munster units in Limerick, in Clare, in Cork, in Tipperary. And basically, they tried to disarm Crown forces, patrols of police, patrols of soldiers. And they would do so by sometimes by rushing them, sometimes by hitting them with hurley sticks, sometimes by running up and shoving a revolver in their stomach and taking these weapons. Uh, and from those weapons, they became a lot more aggressive. It gave them the ability to fight at longer distances. And it also gave them the confidence to take on the Crown Forces. Keep in mind that part of the strength and the power of the government was the aura that its soldiers and police were held by the public. And so when you go in and you take them toe-to-toe, -to -toe, when you disarm and humiliate them, that weakens their soft power. And that seemed to have also inspired IRA units in other parts of counties and other parts of the country to try to do something similar. And so you see a lot of copycat attacks mm -hmm. after a successful one. I remember having a conversation with a military historian, I'm sure both your acquaintance, Lara Joy, who told me that uh, the real problem wasn't so much, wasn't just the weapons, it was ammunition yeah. and that ambushes could last for 
30 seconds to a minute because they would run out of ammunition after that length of time. So we have pretty good quartermaster reports from the IRA. Nationally, in 1921, at the truce, the IRA held about 3,000 rifles. Most of those rifles had about between 30 and 40 rounds of ammunition. That's it. So that meant that if you were in a firefight, you could run out of ammunition. The IRA regarded attacks where they didn't seize as much ammunition as they had fired as failures, which is crazy. It's a crazy position to be in. They did very little sniping or kind of long-range attacks because they didn't have the ammunition. They were bad shots because they didn't have practice ammunition to learn how to shoot properly. So one of the failures of the IRA as an organization, and this can really be laid at the hands of Michael Collins, is the failure to import rifles and ammunition. That was a critical failure, and there's no real easy explanation for it, except it wasn't prioritized by Dublin headquarters. And Collins seems to have accumulated the power over arms purchases in his own office, and he doesn't seem to have followed through. Now, John, in in 1920, the the war intensifies. There's no doubt about that. And the IRA carry out a number of attacks on RIC barracks, uh, some of them quite large barracks, including Mallow and uh, Kilmallock was uh, a celebrated IRA attack on a barracks. How did they come about and why did they come about? So part of what the IRA was trying to do was it was trying to keep members involved. So a lot of these units had been active for four, five, six years without any activity. There had been no Easter Rising in Munster. So those IRA units, they felt it was imperative to show their ordinary volunteers that this was going towards something, that they were involved in something bigger than themselves. So that created a priority for attacking and getting as many people involved as possible. So the initial barracks attacks were conducted in order to secure weapons, but also to get people to participate. So some of these big attacks, they might have three, four, five hundred volunteers involved, not just in the stormy parties, but blocking trees, setting up roadblocks, cutting all the roads all around. And that was a deliberate strategy to maximize the number of people involved, to get them to participate directly, and that in order to move the organization forward. And it wasn't just in Cork, it was in Tipperary, it was in Limerick. And so it's units in different parts of the country coming up with the same idea kind of at the same time. Despite the fact, though, Porik, that you might have as many volunteers as John has just described, three to four hundred, and they would often be attacking RIC barracks where you would have had at the most 20, 25 RIC men, they weren't all by any manner of means successful. Yeah, the IRA were faced with a lot of challenges <clears throat> and right from the beginning they have difficulties in attacking these RIC barracks. One of the very first IRA attacks on a very small barracks is at Gerta Clay and Kerry in April of 1918 and two of the local IRA volunteers are killed during that attempt. And in the very early phase of the war, 1918-1919, their idea is to kind of trick their way into the barracks, see if we can get them to answer the door for some reason and we'll, we'll rush in. That obviously doesn't work, so they then switch their next tactic, which is used in Kilmallock and other places, is to climb onto the for the barracks to smash the slates and to pour in petrol or paraffin and set it on fire. And this works very well at um, Kilmallock in May of 1920. But in fairness to the RAC garrison, they mount a very dogged resistance. They keep fighting until daylight and they have, I suppose, the military victory in that the IRA don't defeat them, but the IRA have the practical victory in that the barrack building is destroyed. Now, the British again see this rooftop tactic being re-employed over and over again, so they find ways to counter it. They put sand on the floor of all the RAC barracks. So if petrol or paraffin is poured in, it will get absorbed. They put sandbags in the windows. They put steel armour plating up. They put barbed wire all the way around them. So the only way the IRA can attack them now is to try and put explosives right up against the barracks. The first time this happens is at the Ballytrain Barracks in Monaghan in February of 1920. That IRA attack is led by Owen O'Duffy and Ernie O'Malley. They placed the explosives under the gable end of the building and the explosion, I think it was gelignite, actually destroyed about half the barracks. But again, in that case, the RAC men continued to fight and hold out. The very last successful attack happens in Ross Carberry in Cork in March of 1921 and again that's a mine that's put up against the building. Now in that case that mine was made by a defector from the British Army Peter Monaghan. He was somebody who knew how to handle explosives and that was the last successful barracks attack. For the last three months of the War of Independence there are no real big successful barrack attacks. IRA attacks and barracks really amount to sniping and it's just a harassment of the forces inside and the thing that holds the IRA back is either a lack of explosives or a lack of knowledge in how to use explosives. Or is it fear of reprisals? Because I'm thinking of the attack on the barracks in Trim in County Meath, which is successful, 
but then leads to appalling reprisals in the town immediately afterwards. In some cases, the IRA would actually put up, for example, after the Renine ambush in, in West Clare, there have been horrific reprisals. And afterwards, the next time the IRA were planning ambushes, they would actually set up roadblocks and things to try and, uh, and prevent them. But I think it's not so much a fear of reprisals on the civilian population. If the IRA took that attitude, they would have called off their campaign entirely. I think the thing is the IRA are held back by the lack of explosives, the lack of expertise. And as the war goes on, the British would draw from the small barracks. They get into very large garrisons and it's simply impossible for the IRA to attack them. Explosives is a very technical thing and also just like the firing devices and the mechanisms, batteries, it's a really wet country. So you're burying stuff. Explosives are getting ruined all the time. Just keeping like a, to have a, a battery charge, that's really difficult. And a, a lot of armies with a lot more <laughs> training and organization than the IRA would have difficulty in that in the conditions of Ireland. Fighting in the w- middle of winter, an Irish winter and trying to blow stuff up is not easy as it sounds. Uh, and even trying to burn stuff because they discovered, I think, Porig, uh, fairly early on, let's not use petrol. Yeah, there's a number of courthouses and RIC barracks burnt out in in Limerick that go quite badly for the IRA and actually cost them more casualties than ambushes at the time. I'm thinking of Drumcullher Courthouse in uh, in West Limerick that was burned in 1920. Three IRA volunteers killed in that and four IRA volunteers killed in 1921 when they tried to burn Croom Courthouse. And the thing that happens there is the IRA, the flammable liquid these men would have been used to was paraffin from paraffin lamps at home. But for the first time they're using petrol to commit these arson attacks and they're not familiar with the dangers of petrol fumes and often they spread out petrol they see it soaked up and they say oh we'll spread out some more somebody in the next room lights a match and the fumes can just take off and the whole thing goes up and there's one infamous example Kilmurray RIC barracks will be familiar to anyone who attended the University of Limerick it's an old castle or, or tower house in ruins just near the UL campus the IRA went in to set that on fire in uh, 1920 one IRA volunteer was killed John Colopy and another one Dennis Maher was very badly wounded and in that case they'd set fire to the building they looked back and they saw that there was a catholic statue of the virgin mary they didn't want to see that statue uh, destroyed or damaged so they rushed back in and part of the uh, wooden roof actually collapsed on top of them and that mortally wounded uh, colopy and incidentally the statue did survive maher's granddaughter who's married to mickey graham a very well-known uh, limerick hurler from the 70s they still have that statue and they're its custodians today john Why did GHQ, General Headquarters, order attacks on income tax offices? Well, in the spring of 1920, there had been a number of successful or half-successful IRA attacks, primarily by the Munster units. And when the IRA attacked a police barracks, the government response generally was to evacuate and pull out in order to prevent vulnerable policemen from being captured or disarmed. That created a certain logic where the general headquarters decided that if we start to burn down evacuated barracks, it would be pretty easy to do. They're not going to rebuild them. That can clear out a whole segment of the police from the countryside. And if we do that, and if we also target local government and local taxation, we'll be undermining British governance in the country will also be supporting these new local authorities, these new local governments, county councils, urban district councils that have been taken over by Republicans, by Sinn Féin in the 1920 local elections. So it's kind of a combined strategy. And it's also, it's a relatively easy tasks to order units to do. And again, it gets a lot of people involved. And so part of what they're trying to do is drive the RIC out of the countryside. And part of what they're trying to do is undermine British governance and strengthen the Republican counterstate. Okay, talk to me then about flying columns, because there's this mythology, I suppose, that it was the flying columns that that won the War of Independence and everything related to the War of Independence is about flying columns, is about 40, 50, 60 men living off the land, etc., etc. Perhaps actually we might start with uh, the words of a leader of one of the flying columns, and you can decide whether you agree with him or not, John. Um, Michael Brennan, who was the officer commanding the East Clare flying column, and participated in a number of offensive actions. And in his witness statement, Bureau of Ministry History witness statement, this is how he remembers the flying columns being established. A great deal of nonsense has been published on the origins of the flying columns of 1920-21. And I must clear up the position, at least as far as East Clare is concerned. 
I have read in many places of how the flying column idea was originated and elaborated by different officers, of how men were trained for it in camps held years before, and of how training and organizational instructions for it were issued in advance. If these things were done, none of us in East Clare ever heard of them. No instruction of any sort to form a flying column ever reached us, and in actual fact, we ourselves did not consciously organize a column. It was a purely spontaneous development which arose directly from the prevailing conditions. Those are the words there of Michael Brennan, who was the officer commanding the East Clare Flying Column. John, would you agree with that last sentence? It was a purely spontaneous development which arose directly from prevailing conditions. The the phrase I use is organic. It's a natural response to the conditions. One of the great myths of the War of Independence is that it was centrally planned. One of the great myths is that Michael Collins was a guerrilla warfare genius who organized all this himself. He didn't. What happened was you had strong local units of the IRA, primarily but not exclusively in Munster, who started to take a local initiative and through that more opportunities for more advanced and more aggressive action became available. So the flying columns developed in different parts of the country almost simultaneously but in a very similar fashion where the British kind of counter-offensive had created a lot of fugitives, a lot of known IRA leaders who would have been living openly and going about their daily business were sought after and became fugitives and went on the run. A number of those folks joined together and traveled together and stayed in the same safe houses together. They began to move about armed. They began to take part in local initiatives, local attacks. They added an extra muscle to local initiatives that was seen as a positive, appointing training officers. Training officers were often folks with military experience, were often expert as soldiers. They would get together in training camps, and then they'd go off and lay ambushes. And that was kind of how the big flying columns that developed in Clare, in East Limerick, in Cork, that's how they developed. And what's fascinating about all this is it's the same development in different parts of the country without coordination. And so it's similar people who have a similar mindset who come to the similar conclusion. And that's how the IRA as an organization really develops throughout the War of Independence. Okay, now with the arrival of the Black and Tans and the Auxiliaries, the so-called RIC Reserve Forces in 1920, the passion of the war changes, the war escalates, and the IRA now begin to plan some major offensives against these forces, most famously and controversially at Kilmichael in November 1920. Now, we're not going to get into the controversy. We could devote two whole programmes to the controversy about whether there was or there was not a false surrender, whether or not auxiliaries were killed in cold blood by the IRA. Um, But uh, let me just talk to you, Porig, about the significance. Why was Kilmichael, irrespective of what did or did not happen. Why was Kilmichael so significant? Well, the first thing about it is the nature of the force involved. The auxiliaries are will be seen today, I suppose, as being like the SAS or the Irish Army Ranger Wing. They're an elite force. So these are kind of seen as military supermen. They're supposed to be the new force that's going to sort out things in Ireland. They're supposed to be unbeatable. The second thing about it is the scale of the British losses at Kilmichael. 17 members of the 18-member uh, patrol are killed, and this is unprecedented. Prior to this, the largest attack, successful attack in the British forces was the Renine ambush at which six members of the RIC and Black and Tans were killed. So for the number of fatalities inflicted by the IRA in attack to treble was uh, profound. The other thing is that Kilmichael, the people who were killed in it were British, they were mostly Englishmen. This was the first time that the war was coming home to people in Britain. Prior to this, members of the British Crown Forces killed in Ireland were largely Irish men in the Royal Irish Constabulary. But these funerals, the bodies were being brought back to London, to Manchester, to Sheffield for big public funerals. And this happens just at the time that the IRA had launched wide-scale arson attacks in Manchester, in Liverpool and in Boole. So suddenly... Ordinary English people were waking up to the fact that there was a large conflict in Ireland and the bodies were coming home and the conflict through the burnings was being brought to our doors all at the same time. And the last thing, I suppose, is that it has a political impact inside the British cabinet. 
Lloyd George, the British Prime Minister, tells Thomas Jones, who was the Secretary to the Cabinet, that the last attack of the rebels, i.e. Kilmichael, was of a different character. The others were assassinations, but this last one, Kilmichael, was a military operation. So the British up to now have been believing their propaganda that the IRA were criminals, they were thugs, they could be very easily dealt with. Now after Kilmichael, they realise for the first time we have a serious military problem. And how important was the military experience of Tom Barry? Because Tom Barry was a World War I veteran. He'd fought in the British Army in the World well, War I. The, first of all, one of the things about the auxiliaries is they were ex-officers. So they had the prestige of the British Army officer class. That's also why their deaths was a bigger deal in Britain. It's because they weren't privates. They were officers. They were decorated war heroes. And so their defeat by half-trained Irish peasants in West Country, that was a pretty big psychological step. Tom Barry was somebody who had pretty extensive war experience. Uh, He had fought, you know, in Mesopotamia, also on the Western Front. He was a very charismatic figure. One of the reasons we still talk about Tom Barry is because he was a great communicator. He wrote a, a fantastic, very readable book. You know, you can debate about its accuracy, but it tells a very rich narrative and he tells it well. He was a very great communicator on TV and radio. And that obviously also translated into his leadership of potential soldiers. So he seems to have been a very effective leader. Uh, He also seems to have kind of gotten his men to accept the idea that they were going to kill or be killed on that little road out in West Cork and really kind of closed ranks and... When you actually go to the uh, Kill Michael site, you realize how close they were. They were only a few yards from them when they started firing. And it got really close and personal. And I think that that was part of Barry's mindset, that you can't go into this thing with half steps, that either you're engaged or you're not engaged. And that was Barry's military genius, I suppose, and one of the reasons we're still talking about him today. Mm. Somebody else we talk about today a lot is uh, Sean McKeown. And uh, lest our listeners think that the War of Independence was only fought in Cork, Clare, Tipperary, Limerick and uh, Kerry. Let's move to the Midlands. And on the 2nd of February 1921, in the townland of Clonfin in County Longford, the IRA ambushed two lorries carrying members of the British Auxiliary Division, sparking a lengthy gun battle in which Four auxiliaries were killed and eight wounded. This is the voice of General Sean McKeown of the Longford Brigade of the IRA describing what happened. We hit them so good and hard. There was four or five killed, nearly all wounded before they surrendered. We got all their equipment, including a Lewis gun and the ammunition for it. I had no man killed or wounded, thank God. Then the reinforcements came and the new battle started again. And therefore, it was a most successful thing that we were able to not only win on the offensive side by the ambush in the first step, but the defensive section in the second engagement and in our defensive section that we beat five times the number of men against us. And, of course, uh, Sean McKeown went on to a distinguished career in the Irish Armed Forces. And one wonders why that was allowed to happen, John, because McKeown was later arrested and he was sentenced to death at his trial. Why wasn't he executed? The short answer is the truce kind of interfered with that plan. Uh, He was sentenced to death and he was arrested in, I think, late February and By the time this trial went through, by the time everything was set up, basically the truce came into effect. It wasn't from a lack of effort on the Republican side. Uh, Michael Collins made probably his most spectacular raid, or one of them was an attempt to get him out of Mountjoy Jail, carried out by Emmett Dalton in a unit disguised as British soldiers. But he was saved by the luck of timing. Timing in warfare is everything, as they say. One of the reasons, perhaps, why he was spared for as long as he was, was his, his treatment of prisoners. Yeah, he, as he mentioned in that clip, he actually captured a number of the auxiliaries uh, alive and he treated them very fairly. He um, had them given first aid, bandaged up, and, you know, they weren't robbed. It was all the IRA came for was basically their weaponry and they were let go. And I suppose part of the reason for doing that is the IRA wanted to be seen as an army, to be seen as a, a chivalrous military professional force and not a gang of bandits or thugs. And we talk about kind of the myth of the flying column. One of the reasons there's so much written about the flying columns is that's the version of the IRA they like to present 
the idea of them being a conventional army, being fighters going out and bravely facing down, you know, black and tans and soldiers on the back roads and in their own home country. And at the time, the British government would have portrayed the IRA as being cowardly, as being unmasculine, as being criminal, as degenerate, only willing to shoot people in the back. And so this is very much a, a much more assertive reflection on themselves. Mm-hmm. And that's why so much attention was put to it by Republican veterans and by the kind of public personas later on. And others buy into that because in your own country, the, the coverage in newspapers like the New York Times, for example, would have been quite negative when it came to the IRA and the activities of the IRA. Right. I mean, like the, the idea of guerrilla warfare, of hit and run tactics was seen as somehow yeah less than noble as if shooting somebody with artillery or dropping a bomb on them was somehow morally superior than shooting somebody disguised and running off but they were subjected to a pretty sustained british propaganda campaign to denounce this style of fighting. And keep in mind that this was also one of the first successful guerrilla wars of the industrial age. And so with that kind of pioneering status also meant that they're transgressing a lot of the rules and behaviors of conventional war at that time. Yeah, the Peninsular War was not part of the industrial age, in case anybody (laughs) uh, 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 wants to correct you on that one. Um, The last six months of the war, the IRA undertook some spectaculars, large-scale ambush. Cross Barry being an example of one that was on the the 19th of March in 1921, 100 members or so of the West Cork uh, Brigade Flying Column involved. Again, uh, uh, Tom Barry. Tell us about some of the big ambushes, John, including Cross Barry. Well, you get in kind of late February, early March, you get about three big ones in Cork. The Cork 1 Brigade at Coolnacahar on the 25th of February, uh, the Cork 2 Brigade in North Cork at Clonbannon on the 5th of March, and then Cross Barry uh, with the 3rd Cork, the West Cork Brigade on the 19th of March. They're all kind of similar in that there were big IRA units involved. You're talking about each one of those, you would have talked about around 100 riflemen with some machine guns, a lot of other people involved in support operations, taking on big forces of the regular British military. So in a way, this was about as formal and about as conventional as the War of Independence got. And in each case, the IRA was successful. They were able to inflict casualties and escape without suffering too much in return. Now, these were kind of one-offs that they weren't really repeated as the war escalated, as the British got to know their business a little bit better, they made it more difficult for the IRA flying columns to operate. Uh, It became more difficult for the IRA to concentrate that number of fighters, of Republican fighters, because you're talking about, as I said, 100, 120, 150 people involved. And so how do you keep them together? How do you feed them? How do you house them? How do you keep the neighbors from not talking about them? And how do you keep their location secret? One of the most successful, the IRA leaders was Liam Lynch. And what he figured out was the way of operating was you create small flying columns in your individual brigades, and then you bring them together for two or three days in a big planned ambush, and then you disperse really fast. And that seemed to be kind of how they were developing and how they were evolving. You don't have a big, huge number of people you have smaller groups and you concentrate them briefly and then scatter because the whole point is you're trying to evade the British counter blow which you know is going to come Okay, on the subject of housing and feeding, logistics can be as important in a war as military actions and the reality of having to feed and shelter large groups of men must have placed a huge strain on the local population. Volunteer Sean McNamara of Clare recalls some of the lengths that people went to to show their support for the IRA. If I had anything to say, there would be some kind of a plaque put in every house that housed us, minded us and took care of us. People came out of their beds when we were three or four days or nights out in the mountains. They got out of their beds to give us their own beds. The people really won the fight because they stuck by us. If people didn't love the people who were out fighting for Irish freedom and were out for it, they had the good sense to keep their mouth shut. John, would uh, you agree with what Sean McNamara said about the support of people? Yeah, I think that there was a a pretty high degree of popular support, and especially in certain parts of the country. If you read British records, the British were very convinced that a big portion of the Irish public was actively supporting the IRA campaign. 
You could also compare the Irish War of Independence with the Irish Civil War. And in the Irish Civil War, the IRA did not have popular support. You know, that's, that was pretty well recorded at the time. And the IRA failed, and they were pretty comprehensively defeated by the National Army, by the Free State Forces, pretty quickly. And that National Army was pretty inferior in terms of equipment, in terms of training to the British Army that faced the IRA. Yet the IRA was, in 1921, was it was continuing to escalate its campaign. It was going no. It wasn't being defeated. It was maintaining its forces, and they could only do that because they achieved a certain level of support, popular support, among the civilian population. Now, Parik, one of the activities of the IRA, this happened in uh, 1920, was the abandonment or the enforced abandonment by the RIC of rural, small rural RIC stations. And they move into the bigger towns. And as we've already discussed, many of these barracks were then destroyed, taken apart brick by brick or just simply burnt to the ground. But was there a downside to that? Because that, you know, on one level, that gives the IRA control of the countryside. But was there a downside to that? Yeah, even though they get like a safe space that they can train, that they can develop, the problem is is that the British really have retreated into the large cities. The IRA controlled the countryside. The British would occasionally make forays into the countryside, but when they did, it was in huge uh, displays of force. You could be talking 6, 8, 10, 12 British Army lorries loaded with troops and maybe an armoured vehicle at the front or at the back. And basically, these were so large that the IRA had difficulty attacking them. For example, the mid Clare Brigade under the, the Barrett family, Richard Mulcahy gave out to him and said, why haven't you attacked any, any of these British combat? voice and he was invited down he sent one of his deputies and the Barretts took him to the top of a hill and just said look at the size of that convoy what are you going to give us to attack it with and the IRA did try to mobilise large ambush parties of up to 100 men in the summer of 1921 I'm thinking of an ambush the IRA had planned at Barna in early July of 1921 which didn't come off because of the uh, the troops that was just near uh, Newcastle West and if you have 100 men down you have a huge problem feeding them you have a huge problem keeping it quiet and the British usually knew these large forces were in the area and in that case at the Barna ambush the British arrived at 12 noon on the 11th of July 1921 just after the ceasefire came into effect they pulled up in their lorries in the ambush position and they basically laughed at the IRA guys and said we know you've been here all week were you wondering why we didn't uh, come so the problem is that this kind of develops into a stalemate in some of the most active areas in parts of Clare and parts of Limerick and in parts of Cork that the British really, you know, can only come into the countryside in these large groups. It's very useful for the IRA because they can see them and hear them coming from miles away, but they can't really hit at them. Certainly not without machine guns and without explosives. Two things the IRA were very short on. Now we're going to take a quick break and we're going to return and talk about the burning of the Custom House in May 1921, its significance as a military operation and or as a dramatic act of propaganda. Follow us on Twitter at RTE History Show. Welcome back to The History Show on RTE Radio 1. We're talking about the Irish War of Independence and our subject today is the IRA at war. We've been discussing some of the most important IRA engagements and operations of the conflict. And the last major engagement to take place has been the subject of many heated debates over the last century, the burning of the Custom House on the 25th of May 1921 by the Dublin Brigade of the IRA. This operation is widely viewed as a military disaster and it's generally accepted that the IRA in Dublin was wiped out as a result and de Valera was blamed. I'm joined in studio by historians Liz Gillis and Paul O'Brien. Liz, let's, as it were, start at the end. Would you characterise this operation as a disaster? No, not from the research that I've done um, and I've been researching it for over 10 years now. A lot of new records have come out thanks to the military archives. The pension files have been fantastic in, in revealing the story and there's many letters that uh, the men wrote while they were in prison and what they say about this operation is that it was not a disaster and this is from the men who were actually arrested on the day. So with their testimony, there's like 68 
them that have written letters and testimonies and then the many pension files, a very different story mm. has come to light. Why did De Valera order such a big full frontal engagement? Well, the first thing to say is that the Custom House was always on the radar of the IRA. It wasn't actually De Valera's idea. But in terms of Dev suggesting big attacks, he'd been in America for the majority of the War of Independence. So obviously newspaper reports are reporting or stating what's going on in Ireland and it's not good. The IRA are seen as murderers and so on. It's not legitimate army. So um, when he returns at the end of December 19. 19- 20. He's coming back with that view that we are a legitimate army, we are a legitimate government and we should engage in these big actions but for the propaganda value that this will garner. So two targets are put forward, an attack on Beggar's Bush Barracks or the Custom House and then you have the surveillance and the intelligence work going on as to which would be the most viable target. And from a military perspective, Paul, which was the more viable of these two targets? Uh, the Customs House would have been, and it's kind of a soft target. Beggar's Bush Barracks was the depot for the Auxiliary Division of the Royal Irish Constabulary, which were the toughest unit that the IRA came up against during the Irish War of Independence. So the Customs House would have been a very soft target compared to that. You might have a few policemen on patrol outside, but you wouldn't have had a military picket within the building or a police picket. And less chance of civilian casualties as well, because Beggar's Bush is in a very built-up area. Uh, I disagree agree with you there. I think there'll be more chance. I think the area of operations uh, around the Customs House was colossal because they attacked it as we know now at lunch hour and you would have had a huge amount of people, amount of shops around there. Brooks Thomas was there also on the way to the docks as well. So you would have had thousands of people working in the docks back in uh, 1921. So to, that wasn't the reason why it was chosen that there would have been fewer, there, there wouldn't have, in fact what you're saying I, is there would not have been fewer ca- for civilian casualties. Definitely not and I don't think civilians when you do a military analysis of this civilians don't come in. You have to factor in casualties in every military operation that you do. I think what was more important was what was actually in the building which was paperwork to do with the Inland Revenue local government, the estate duty registers, stamp duty and also income tax as well. So they were the main things and they wanted to cripple this British administration in Ireland for all those particular divisions within the government. Liz, how did Collins feel about the operation? Well, this is another um, myth that has been talked about in relation to the operation that Collins is wholeheartedly against this operation. But again, it has been revealed that this wasn't the case. He's against the initial plans because using Dick McKee's original plans, he was the OC of the Dublin Brigade in 1918 and that's when he first suggested that the attack the Custom House and it was going to be like in mini-1916, there were going to be barricades erected around um, the streets near the Custom House. The barracks were going to be patrolled by volunteers to stop the military from getting to the Custom House and that was literally the plans they were going to use again in 1921 and 120 men would be needed for this operation. But Collins was against that because he believed it was too much like a rising. So he says to Oscar Trainer, who was then the OC of the Dublin Brigade, that um, you're not doing it. You have to change this. Um, you're not going to use 120 men. If you cannot do it without 120 men, you're not doing it at all. And you're not going to put barricades around the city. And that's where the compromise was reached. You have uh, members of the 1st Battalion that will provide cover in the immediate vicinity in the streets around Custom House is not against the operation it's the actual original plans but then that has an effect or an impact on what actually happens A lot more than 120 men took part in it Oh yeah um, at my last count I have 289 people involved including one woman Delia Young and that number will rise as more pension files are released from the military archives Paul what were the plans for the operation? The plan for the operation was to complete destruction of the contents of the building, which would also involve the destruction of the building as well. Uh, they were very smart. Limo Doherty, who was um, the 5th Battalion IRA in the engineers section, he acquired uh, plans for this, like from the National Library. So they knew the inside of the building. It was, it was planned out well enough that they knew what they wanted to do. But in every planning phase, like you have simplicity, security, surprise, speed and purpose. The big mistake that they made was their egress, as as in getting away, which caused a major problem with them. Also providing overwatch, as Liz mentioned there a few moments ago, where they didn't want barricades put up to block access to the building, uh, to block the roads and things like that. So when they provided overwatch, they actually brought it too close to the building. So when things did kick off, 
the British arrived and were actually on top of them before they knew what to do. Armaments? What were they going in with? Very little. You're talking about a revolver with six bullets for six each amount. Six bullets. Six, six bullets. Uh, one, one thing about the IRA that it's very, very overlooked at this particular time. We live on an island and it's very hard to get arms and ammunition. <laughs> and that was a major problem for the IRA at that time. Most attacks that they did on barracks, also against the auxiliaries and ambushes and things like that, was to get arms and ammunition. So they were very low in that. When you take a look what they were going up against, like the British Army with armoured cars, guns, machine guns and things like that, they were heavily outgunned. So fire discipline in a firefight is actually very difficult with soldiers today. So if you give a guy one gun with six bullets, he's going to use them in a matter of seconds. Mm. Um, Liz, on paper, it looked like it could go as planned, but what actually happened on the day? Well, the operation was planned to take place at 12.55, so at that time, everyone would converge. Now, the 2nd Battalion, led by Tom Ennis, because he's the OC of that battalion, they were the ones that were actually going to be in the building, setting fire to the contents, um, and then supported by members of the other battalions around the building, and also members of the squad and the active service unit inside the building. And now, they had raided for paraffin and had and bolt cutters and all of this robbed a couple of lorries they arrive outside the custom house the bearers replace side of it that's the way they actually go in and this was time for lunch time and as the lorries arrive various groups of men start to go into the custom house take the couple of tins each and then head into the building then they gathered the staff now they chose lunch time because there wouldn't as many, be as many people in the building and while the staff are gathered they're brought down to the main hall and guarded by the squad and the active service unit each volunteer was told where to go and they were to close the windows and then prepare get all the paperwork pile them together throw the paraffin on and then one whistle blast was signal and once everyone was ready that they were to set fire to the contents Now, as you say, this is well covered by the military service pension collection, uh, by the files there, by the Bureau of Military History. And uh, in fact, you mentioned the squad. Vinnie Byrne, a member of the squad, described his involvement in his Bureau of Military History witness statement in that operation. I proceeded to the second floor. I opened the office door and sitting inside were a lady and a gentleman, civil servants, having tea. I requested them to leave, stating that I was going to set fire to the office. The gentleman stood up and said, Oh, you can't do that. I showed him my gun and told him I was serious. He got very worried about the whole thing. I said to him, You had better get out at once, unless you want to be burned alive. The lady asked me, Could she get her coat? And I replied, Miss, you'll be lucky if you get out with your life. They then left. I opened the safe and removed all the ledgers. I collected all the other papers and files I could find and placed them on the table. I then proceeded to pour petrol over the office and on the papers. On hearing the signal, the whistle, I stepped outside. I lit a ball of paper and, slightly opening a door, I flung it into the office. In a flick, the whole office was ablaze. Paul, how quickly did Dublin Castle become aware that the Custom House was being attacked and how quickly did they come to the aid of uh, the Custom House? Within a few minutes, actually, there was a phone call made and also someone arrived at the castle to inform the British that there was something going on at the Customs House. And there's a great military axiom that states that no plan survives contact and that's really what happened with the IRA that day. The auxiliaries, I believe, were a special forces unit of their time. They were ready to go. They immediately got into three Crossley tenders, supported by an armoured car. And this is F F Company. This This isn't from Beggars Bush. This this, is from Dublin Castle. This is from Dublin Castle. This is F Company that were based there. And within minutes, they came upon the IRA. The guys who were providing Overwatch, as we mentioned earlier, were too close to the building. And a gun battle ensued. Dan Head, one of the volunteers, threw a hand grenade. He was killed. But that was where the auxiliaries suffered their most casualties. There were five uh, auxiliaries injured in that. They dismounted from their vehicles and began to engage then the IRA coming out of the building and those within the building as well. So a major gun battle at lunch hour ensued on the case. And what was happening inside when all of this was going on, Liz? Once they heard the, the gunshots outside, a whistle blast is heard. But the volunteers weren't fully finished their work. So some of them run down to Tom Ennis and tell them that, you know. Tom Ennis is in command of the operation. Yeah, and they tell him that they're not finished. So he sends them back up and this causes a few minutes delay. They do then get up while the fighting is going on outside. And once they're ready to go, the place is set on fire. But um, we then have members of the squad that are inside the building 
and they're engaging with the auxiliaries outside. Um, the fire does take hold and then the signal to evacuate was two whistle blasts and they hear the two whistle blasts. But by that stage, you do have them completely surrounded on the outside. So the choices are either try and get out by ourselves or mix with the crowd. Some take the first option and do manage to get away. Others decide they'll take their chances and mix with the staff. Paul, um, obviously Tom Ennis is inside. Oscar Trainer and Paddy Daly, who would have been other, two of the other uh, prominent uh, commanders of the operation, are outside. What are they doing? What happens to them? The major gun battle going on outside and I think a lot of people are trying to escape. The auxiliaries have much more firepower, as I said, with the armoured cars. Q Division then arrive from the railway hotel along the quays and really the building is surrounded. All ways of egress are actually cut off and the IRA leadership some of them get away the guys who are providing overwatch get away but the people coming out of the building even those mixing with the crowd are rounded up by the auxiliaries and those in charge civil servants in charge are tasked with picking out their staff from members of the IRA and they're separated and a lot of the IRA are actually uh, captured. Liz, the Custom House is on fire. There are fire stations very, very close indeed to the Custom House, but uh, help doesn't arrive. No, because another part of the plan was that all the fire stations, both within the city limits and outside, were going to be taken over as well. So at 12.55, as the volunteers are entering the Custom House, the communication lines are being cut by the 5th Battalion Engineers and also the fire stations are occupied by the volunteers. K Company toured the battalion take over Tara Street, which is the closest fire station, 4th Battalion take over Thomas Street Fire Station 4th Battalion are in Dorset Street and Buckingham Street Fire Stations and so you do have people ringing making the phone calls because you know people see a fire first reaction is to ring the fireman and the phone calls are answered and the people are lied to they're told that help is on the way but it's actually the volunteers that are saying that help is on the way and in the case of Crumlin they stole the fire engine and they drove out as far as Crumlin kept her out for two hours and it's in Thomas Street Fire Station that you have Delia Young who's a member of the Nina and Heron branch now she is the only woman that I found um, that is actually mentioned as having a role to play in, in the the events that day and she helped disarm the alarm in Thomas Street Fire Station she helped cut the hoses and then she hid the guns and kept watch um, for the volunteers that were inside to alert them if anyone was coming so the fire stations were in the hands of the volunteers it sort of doesn't bode well for the authorities at the time it took them a while to cop on that there wasn't help coming Mm. from Tara Street especially Meanwhile, Paul, the fight is going on. How long does it does it last? Does it peter out very quickly? I mean, you're talking about uh, uh, the IRA having virtually probably no ammunition left uh, by, almost by the time, or very quickly after the Oxys arrive. Yes, it does peter out very quick. Most firefights are only a couple of minutes long. The auxiliaries are an aggressive force. They're not police officers as we know today. And they brought the fight really to the IRA and quickly took control of the situation on the day. The IRA were forced. Those that managed to escape did, but the others were arrested and held there. They handed over by two o'clock. Actually, they handed over to the British military who arrived from the Royal Barracks. Uh, The Wiltshire Regiment came up and took control then and the auxiliaries uh, moved back to their base. But uh, it was very, very short uh, firefight. As I said, the IRA could not sustain a long gun battle. And really, um, Vinnie Bourne even talks about he like he used up like I think three magazines, two or three magazines in a matter of seconds in the gun battle that he was in. Presumably, as a member of the squad, he would yeah. have been one of the better armed yeah. uh, volunteers on on that day to have three actually three magazines uh, along with them. Liz, the rounding up then of the the volunteers. What happened there? Why were so many of the volunteers captured? Well, the ones that are captured are the ones that are in the building. So predominantly it's members of the 2nd Battalion and you do have the squad and a large proportion of the active service unit. So the ones that decided to get out Jim Slattery is, is a squad member, Sean Doyle's a squad member, and as they're running out, the two of them come under fire. Jim Slattery was shot in the hand, he later lost his hand. Sean Doyle is fatally wounded, but he manages to get himself to the Matter Hospital. He died a couple of days later. Tom Ennis, um, he decides he will not stay around. He is the last to leave the building. As he's running out, he gets shot twice and horrifically uh, wounded, but again, he manages to get to safety. So those who are left behind, they dump the guns and they mingle with the crowds. But as Paul had said, you've got the supervisors that are called in 
to identify who's actual staff. Um, so that leaves like a, a, a large number. It's actually over 100. Generally, it's accepted that it's 80. It's over 100 members of the volunteers, the IRA, that's arrested. And there's great photographs. You can sort of see who's a civilian and who's IRA because the men are wearing, obviously, the hats at the time. But um, the civilians... They're just, their face, they're showing their faces with their hands up, whereas the IRA meant the hats are down, the hats are actually covering the faces so you can see sort of who's who. They're interrogated on the key side. And in some cases, in one case in particular, Ned Breslin, um, he gets an unmerciful hiding from the auxiliaries because when they were searching them, they found a bullet had actually uh, fallen through a hole in the pocket of his waistcoat. So he got really, he, it was an awful time he got. But then they're separated as well into two groups. The majority taken to Arbor Hill Prison held there for a couple of weeks but then you've got 12 that are taken to Mount Joy and they're the ones that are seen to be dangerous or the auxiliaries or the authorities know these fellas are more involved and they say and that includes Ned Breslin and many other squad members and after that then the operation is over. Paul, how many died that day? How many casualties were there? I think roughly about five Irish volunteers were killed about four civilians as well there was ten civilians wounded and five auxiliaries wounded which is actually quite low for such an engagement. The IRA plan was flawed, as Liz mentioned, in where you can see the escape wasn't really looked into properly, how they actually get away. And that's how so many of them were actually captured. Given that, that what, what you've just said, how can it be seen as anything other than a military disaster? Well, it's successful because they set out the mission. The mission plan was to destroy the building and destroy its contents, which they actually did. OK, uh, when you take a look at that, that was successful. It was the last throw of the dice, really, when you take a look at it from the IRA's point of view. Arms and ammunition were very, very limited at this time. And I think like that's Dublin. So the rest of the country would have been possibly worse uh, in relation to arms and ammunition. It actually catapulted Ireland onto the world stage because it hit the headlines all over the world that this happened in the capital city of Ireland. And that's what Dev and the IRA leadership wanted. They wanted this out there. It brought the British to the negotiating table uh, in June and then with the signing of the uh, truce in July and then the treaty. So in one way it was a success but all military commanders must factor in deaths and also the capture of personnel in an operation. And this obviously were very close to the truth. They wouldn't have necessarily known that or they certainly wouldn't have known that at the time. But so therefore we don't have much of a period of time in which to evaluate. But did the IRA change its tactics after the, the Custom House? Yeah, uh, very quickly. And that was one of the things about the IRA is that fighting the guerrilla war, they're fighting at their advantage in a situation that suits them. The one thing also about this action. Over 100 people are arrested, 111 roughly and they lose five volunteers but the IRA weren't wiped out. There was over 4,000 full-time and part-time volunteers that were still available for service. The active service unit, they could have refilled four times. They had to stop recruitment of the active service unit and again this is all documented. But that night they're out attacking again. So the authorities think there's over 100 and men that they now have in custody so they're decimated but it wasn't the case and what they do then is incendiary attacks they start to actually target transport and you have the big fire um, at the shell factory where 40 tenders are taken out now if you actually destroy 40 military lorries that means that those platoons cannot get from point A to point B and there were bigger operations going to happen as well um, just before the truce one in particular was the big shoot up that was planned in O'Connell Street There was to be another Bloody Sunday wasn't there, there? was to be another Bloody Sunday as well but um, the big shoot up in O'Connell Street was that they were going to converge at Corfu from all points of O'Connell Street and just shoot everything that was in it auxiliaries Crown Forces police women that were with them um, and that was called off just moments before um, the, the truce was declared. And again, um, all the testimony is there. OK, Liz and uh, Paul, Liz Gillis and Paul O'Brien, thank you both very much indeed. Now, the Custom House fire burned for five days. And although the fire brigade was on the scene for most of that time, eventually, uh, seemingly attempting to quench the flames. Well, there's a good reason why it took so long to put out the fire. Dublin Fire Brigade historian Lars Fallon has researched the fire service's role in this engagement. Earlier, he spoke to our producer, Lorcan Clancy. I would argue that the Custom House was destroyed because of the complicity of the Dublin firemen in destroying it in a normal situation. In peacetime, that building was very, very salvageable. But a decision was made and the firemen's actions 
condemn the building to destruction, without a doubt. Laz Fallon is a retired Dublin firefighter, fire service historian and the author of the book The Fireman's Tale, published by Kilmainham Tales. On the burning of the Custom House in 1921 and the role of Dublin firemen in that burning. From the time Dublin Fire Brigade was founded in 1862, there was an undercurrent of nationalism within the capital's fire service, and during the Irish Revolutionary period, it was stronger than ever. Within the brigade, going from pension statements, going from speaking to the sons of some of these men in my own early days in the job, and going back to the records and to their own personal papers, they say that most of the people in the job were either volunteers on the active list, as they call them, or what they class as active sympathisers. People who would never have sworn an oath as an IRA man, but would be very well prepared to carry out operations on their behalf. From 1917 on, under new Chief Officer Captain John Myers, the Republican sympathies in the brigade became even more apparent. When he became chief, you see a change in the brigade. You see people beginning to be recruited who would never have got in in the past. People who were known to the police people who had political files on them in Dublin Castle. Like these people would never have been able to get into the job in the past because they would have had needed police vetting. Now they were the very people that the police were fighting on the streets of Dublin and they were being recruited into the DFB. As the War of Independence progressed, there was much hand-in-glove work and low-level cooperation from the fire brigade. For example, in 1920, there was a fire at the church on Rathmines Road, a church where arms and ammunition were being stored. In that case, after arriving, Captain Myers is approached by the sacristan at the church. He's also the local quartermaster for the IRA, who explains that there are arms and ammunition stored in the basement of the church. What Myers does is he clears the Rathmines firemen out, puts Dublin firemen in and arranges with the volunteers to get in and clear their equipment out. And the fire is dealt with. And at the end of it, there's no mention on any official report or mention to the police that the building has contained guns. Arms and equipment were moved around the city by Dublin Fire Brigade vehicles and DFB ambulances made sure IRA casualties didn't have any incriminating documents or weapons on them before taking them to the hospital. The Fire Brigade is an agency of local government. It's part of Dublin Corporation. And Dublin Corporation, in effect in those years, were part of the alternative state the shadow state that existed, that recognised the Republic and their allegiance was to Dáil Éireann. It's with the burning of the Custom House that we see a change from cooperation to active involvement, as the Dublin Fire Brigade played a crucial role in the operation. Senior officers of the IRA approached the Fire Brigade for advice. And if you think about it, you know, the Custom House is a big stone bill. It's a difficult building to burn. You know, firemen are experts in burning buildings. If you spend enough time in a burning building, you get to know very quickly how best to make it burn and how best to put it out. And of course, the Custom House is the big tax office. It's the one where the Inland Revenue are operating out of. It's their headquarters. The building had been identified as a target as far back as 1917. By taking out a tax office, you're destroying part of the financial apparatus of the enemy state, as they would have seen it. To ensure that the building kept burning... Part of the plan was that the IRA would take over all six fire stations in the city. In most cases, the firemen were very compliant hostages. K Company, the 3rd Battalion, took Tara Street, which was the the one that had to be taken, the headquarters of the Dublin Fire Brigade. The firemen were answering the phones with an IRA man sitting beside them because the auxiliaries, the police, were starting to ring to tell them that the custom house was, was on fire and asking why they weren't turning out to it. When the fire brigade finally arrived at the custom house, a large number of firemen went into the building. In theory, to find the source of the fire and begin fighting it. In fact, they went into the building to assess the damage that had already been caused and to spread the fire into the remaining parts of it that hadn't been burnt. They go into the building, they take the unused cans of paraffin, they spread the fire into parts that haven't been spread into. And one of the firemen, Michael Rogers, who was an IRA volunteer, writing afterwards said, we had the building practically at our mercy and I can tell you now that many parts of it that were not on fire when we entered were blazing nicely in a short while. Every step of the way, you can see how the fire brigade made feigned attempts to put out the fire. 
There was, of course, an ample water supply in the form of the River Liffey, which runs beside the building, but it seemed to take an extraordinarily long time to set up the hoses and produce any water. If you look at newsreel and this Pathé newsreel of the firemen at the Custom House, you see them with hoses, you see the water coming from the hoses, and by and large you see it hitting the walls of the Custom House and running onto the pavement. Very little of it seems to be going through the windows. There's no determined effort to save this building being made. In 1921 at the Custom House, they've moved over from being firefighters into basically being the arsonists who have the leisure to travel through the building and make sure that it burns. There are official reports from the British talking about the strange amount of uh, rekindled fires starting back in areas that they had thought had been dealt with. The British commander, General MacReady, later mentioned in a report that he was unsatisfied with the firemen's efforts. It seems as though the British never really realised the extent of the infiltration within Dublin Fire Brigade. Because nobody within that British military mindset looked at the firemen as the enemy. It was taken that they were just, you know, it was poor firemanship rather than a deliberate act. They didn't figure it out. They didn't. No, they didn't. I mean, to the point that when the peace talks started the following month, the security on the mansion house for the peace talks was provided by firemen. The Dublin firemen, the uniform body of the corporation, were seen as a neutral body and acceptable to both sides. Clark and Clancy was reporting there. He was speaking to Dublin Fire Brigade historian Laz Fallon about the role of the Fire Brigade in the burning of the Custom House. I'm joined once again, finally, by historians John Borgonovo and Porik Og O'Rourke. John, uh, what, what are your thoughts? So do you have thoughts on the Custom House? Was it a success? Was it a failure? Was it a ridiculous uh, operation to begin with? Did it achieve any objectives? I think it was a... Military setback, but a political success. The IRA suffered significant losses, but that's what you have an army for. If you're not willing to lose men, you have no business fighting. In terms of the media coverage of it, it was a tremendous success. It was a propaganda coup. It basically put into question the entire British government policy and, and stated claim that it controlled Dublin. Here was a major, here was an iconic center of governance in the city burned to the ground in broad daylight. And if the government couldn't control Dublin, what did it control in Ireland? So I think strategically, I think it was a a masterstroke and I think it was a success. I think part of the idea of it being a failure was very much uh, it was laid at the feet of De Valera for political reasons in the, in the Civil War period and also given as a, as a reason for the truce that came later on when it, that's really a tangential and not really quite accurate depiction. Party, would you agree? Uh, I think, you know, this idea of a daring daylight raid in the second city of the empire, it provides fantastic imagery. Um, It's very good from a propaganda point of view. In terms of political effect, there were a lot of papers in the customs house which were destroyed, which dealt with local administration, the setting up of the new northern government, so it was a setback there. But I would ask, why couldn't the same operation have been done at night with four or five men sneaking in with cans of petrol and they could have achieved the same level of destruction but without the big propaganda victory? Mm. And again, I think it's the IRA wanting to be seen as a large force. Now, one one of the problems with it is, is that to me, it breaks the strength of the Dublin Brigade of the IRA. And Richard Mulcahy, who was IRA Chief of Staff, said, quote, the grip of our forces in Dublin must be maintained and strengthened at all costs. And no number of victories in any provincial areas can have any value if Dublin is lost as a military sense. In the Custom House, there's five IRA volunteers killed, there's 80 taken capture, and after this, there's a huge amount of weapons lost. And if you look at the accounts of IRA volunteers, the time in Dublin in um, in June and early July 1921, they're desperately short of ammunition. They're actually going to each other's company areas and stealing ammunition and guns from each other. IRA volunteers in Dublin talking about taking rifle bullets, 303 rifle bullets, cutting them in half and trying to fit them into their handguns. And that is a disaster waiting to happen. So we often hear that the IRA only had two or three weeks worth of ammunition and fight left in them. To me, I think that's a quote about the Dublin Brigade of the IRA, because down the country, places like Clare, Cork, Limerick, they're under pressure, but they can continue the fight. They say we only had 20, 30 rounds of ammunition per rifle, but that's all we ever had. And areas like Waterford, Galway, Mayo, Roscommon are starting to come into the fight. But the fact that Dublin is struggling is a real blow to the IRA. That partly answers the final question I was going to ask you because you are the author of a book called Truce, Murder, Myth and the Last Days of the Irish War of Independence. Did the truce save 
the IRA? I think it, it saved them from collapse in Dublin. As I said, the IRA were still able to carry out some large uh, operations, but it, it developed really patchily. You know, some parts of the country could survive. Uh, Dublin may have collapsed. But the reality was that the British needed this break as much as the IRA did because their forces were under quite a lot of pressure. It was bad propaganda internationally from them. And the reality is that at the end of the day, the British were never going to round up every single IRA man. The IRA volunteers were never going to be pushing armoured vehicles into the Liffey and literally driving British into the, the sea. So it was inevitable that some attempt at a ceasefire and finding a political solution would have to come. John Borganovo and Parik Og O'Rourke, thank you both for joining us this evening. That's uh, about all we've got time for on the programme. My thanks tonight to all my guests and also to the archivists in the military archives for their invaluable assistance with this programme. Our researcher is Liz Gillis. On sound tonight was Cara O'Hare. Our readers tonight were Simon Delaney and Daniel Costello. Join us at the same time next week when we'll be continuing our series on the War of Independence and you can find podcasts of all our episodes on our website rte.ie forward slash history. The History Show is a Pegasus production for RTE Radio. For now, for me, Miles Dungan and producer Lorcan Clancy, goodbye and thanks for listening. 